Lima. I want to welcome everyone here in the name of the Lord. If you're visiting us, welcome. Um, there's a there is a uh, there's a God in this world, you know, and He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Right. We need to keep our trust and our focus on Him. Amen. Right. Amen. And uh, you know, this day we we celebrate uh, Father's Day on Sunday, and um, I know that there are sometimes uh, mothers who are mother and father in some cases, um, in the sense that they are single parent families. Um, so, uh, without cheating the fathers out of the, the blessed day of what a father is, uh, I do want to, again, wish the fathers a very happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Today I want to talk to you about the godly father and one example that has been really brought out into my mind was uh, in Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, um, just a little bit about Joshua, if you don't know, Joshua was the predecessor of uh, Moses. Moses. Um, Moses, when Moses died, he handed pretty much the torch down to Joshua. Uh, did I say president? The successor yeah. of Moses. Uh, he was the next person to take control of Israel. And Joshua was chosen not because uh, he was just, just a man of God who loved God, but he was so on fire and so sold out for God that he loved God, he loved Israel, his people, and he loved, he loved his family uh, and dedicated his family to God. And what we know about Joshua and why Joshua also was chosen was that when Joshua and Caleb and the ten other spies went across the Jordan into the promised land, when they caught back, all twelve of them, ten of them said, there's no way we can conquer the land. But only two, Joshua and Caleb, said, we can do it. God is on our side. No matter how big that task is, we believe and have faith that God can give us victory. Amen. How many know that's a man of God? Amen. Amen. To, to see, to understand, to look at the task that is ahead and to say, I know it's big, I know it is difficult, but God is on my side. That's right. And he had his faith not in himself, but in God. And that made him a godly man. But he also raised his family to the ways of the Lord. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua just gets done lecturing Israel after they have come into the promised land. And he gives them this big lecture telling them, look at what God has done for you. And this is where we'll begin reading in verse 14. After the lecture, he says, now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Verse 14. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. How many of you know that this call is even to us today? Amen. Amen. Stop serving the world. Stop serving the things of sin. Stop serving the other ways that you came from. You are no longer a slave of Egypt. You are no longer a slave to sin. Become now a servant of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then it says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. You know, I always thought that was kind of weird. Like, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Now, who would find it evil to serve the Lord? Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. There are a lot of people who find it a burden to serve the Lord. They find it not as God is evil or, oh, it's evil, but they find it a burden. They find it as if it is that God is a taskmaster. Like, God is telling them to do something. That is not right. Instead, they would rather serve the world. They would rather serve the ways of sin rather than God. They think that God's ways are not the right ways. They would rather choose to 
serve themselves. They would rather choose to serve the ways of the devil. They would rather choose to serve the ways of sin rather than God. And when you tell them about God, like stop cussing, stop having profanity, stop getting drunk, look at yourself, you're always cussing, your Facebook page is full of profanity, you've got nothing but filth in your life, cut it out, listen to the music you're listening to, listen to the words, what they're saying, do you not know that it is demonically filled? Amen. They will look at you as if you're crazy, and they will say, you're insane. There's nothing wrong with what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with what I'm watching. There's nothing wrong to what I'm listening to. And they will look at you like you're evil. You're bad. That's right. That's right. Like, why am I bad? I'm trying to guide you to the right direction. But they will now point and come back at you. That's why Jesus says it this way. He says, do not cast your pearls before swine. Do not give what is holy to the dogs because they will trample on it and they will turn around and attack you. Right. Sure. Sometimes it's like that when you're a good father. Sometimes it's like that when you're a godly father. You give your kids good instructions, godly instructions, the ways of the Lord, and only to be met with contempt to be met with. I don't know what you're talking about, old man. Right. I hate you. It does not happen in my house. Yeah. If it slammed the door, there'd be no doors in the, in the bedrooms. Amen. <laughs> but I have heard it over and over again. We've watched shows where Suzanne and I watch and said, that was our kid. Somebody be praying in tongues. <laughs> Amen? Amen. But sometimes they look at it like you're doing what you're saying to them is evil. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Right. You know, I always say you can't lead a horse, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. If you try to make a horse drink, you'll only drown it. Right. You'll only drown the horse. We look around in our lives and we may give instructions and, and tell people certain things about, about their life. But you know what? They'll continue doing whatever you they want to do. And sometimes as a pastor, as God's bishop in the church, it makes me frustrated. Wow. God, why are they not doing the right thing? Why are they raising the family this way? Why are they treating their children this way? Why is their children acting this way? God, I'm frustrated. Why is the husband acting like this towards the wife? Why is the wife acting like this towards the husband? I don't get it, God. It's so frustrating. And sometimes it makes you just want to look and say, you know what, God? Oh, I don't know, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. That's right. And you have to make that own public declaration in your life. That's right. Not to say, I'm going to be like the Joneses. Right. Not to say, I'm going to be like them or like them. I'm going to. You have to come to a declaration, a proclamation in your life, in your family, in your home, in the words of what you say that ask for me and my house, we will serve God. Amen. Amen. And sometimes it's about sitting and having a camp meeting in your living room with your kids, with your family, and say, listen, I don't know what pack of wolves raised you. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't living in this house. <laughs> As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And until you grow up and you get your own house, you choose whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, fathers, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord 
to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us out and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who did not, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome when you stand for God, when you stand for God to be able to look at other families and who, who have also looked at you and said, you know what? Me too. As for me and my house, we also will serve the Lord. The idea for creating a day for children to honor their fathers began right here in America. Surprise. By the Hallmark card people. <laughs> By a lady in Spokane, Washington, and her name was Sonora Dodd. She thought of the idea of Father's Day while listening to a Mother's Day sermon in 1909. Having been raised by her father after her mother died, Sonora wanted her father to know how special he was to her. It was her father that made all the parental sacrifices and was in the eyes of his daughter a courageous, selfless, and loving man. Her father was born in June, so she chose to hold the Father's Day celebration in Spokane, Washington, on the 19th of June. Whoa. Pretty neat, huh? 1910. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge proclaimed the third Sunday in June to be Father's Day. Roses are the Father's Day flowers, red to be worn for living father and white if the father has died. Do you know that? Pretty neat, huh? Whoa. You know, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and unappreciated heroes of all of humanity. Wow. They really are. One time a little boy was asked to define Father's Day. He said, it's just like Mother's Day, except you spend less time on the present. <laughs> oh, my. Is that true? <laughs> The greatest, numbers, the greatest number of long-distance calls are made on Mother's Day. The largest number of collect calls are made on Father's Day. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> these are That's a good facts. One. That's right. Whoa. Dad's favorite saying, go ask your mother. Yeah. Just wait till I get home. <laughs> When I was your age, I used to walk in the, to school in the snow. I'm busy right now. We could go to many places in the Bible for an example of Godly Father, but again, one, just by reading what we read, is no doubt Joshua. Amen. There are a lot of things that I, we can say about Joshua, just look at his life, but for the sake of time, I just want to mention really two things that really jumped out on me when it came down to Joshua. And when we look at the, the uh, story of Joshua and the life of Joshua, we know one thing is that Joshua was the priest of his home. Amen. And how many of you know, fathers, that you are to be the priest of your home? Amen. The priest of your home. You see, he acknowledged his responsibility for the spiritual life of his family. He spoke for his family. He declared their intent. It is a father's duty then to make sure his children know how to be saved and how to walk in the ways of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The greatest thing a father can pass on to his children is to love God. Oh, Amen. Amen. That's the father's duty. He is the priest, the one who stands and prays for his children, who, who calls and teaches them the ways of God. <laughs> The family will usually follow the parent, especially the father. Some have said a boy loves his mother, but he follows his father. Amen? Amen. Think about it. He loves his mother, but he follows the father. 
We have heard it over and over again where father, where kids say, I'm never going to be like my father. He was abusive. Only to grow up sometimes and become just like that. Yep. Scary, isn't it? Yes. We have a huge example to be as priests in our home. We have to be an example to show them what it means to love God, to pray, to read the Bible, to seek the Lord. <laughs> that when they know, when they grow up, they know there is a Father who has that love for God. What other example do they have? A pastor they see once a week, maybe twice? We're not to be, we're not to be the examples to your kids. Amen. You're to be the example to your kids. We teach your kids. We teach you. We guide you in the right direction, but your children see you 24 hours a day. Right. Better you than me. <laughs> For me. But you are raising them. Your kids are seeing you. They need to see that you are the priest of that home. You have made the declaration for your family. <clears throat> and when I say priest, it means being the priest of God, not of the devil. Amen. Amen. A young kid was dying, and his father was so heartbroken because he knew his, it wasn't long before his young, young boy would find himself passed away. So the young father had taught his, his son a lot about God and he sat down at the very end and told his son whether or not he was afraid. Are you afraid to meet Jesus? My boy, as the Godfather said. Blinking away with a few tears, the little fellow bravely said, no. Not if he's like you, Dad. Whoa. Not if he's like you. We have to tell and show our kids what it means and how much, what it means wow. that God loves you. That the Father God loves you. Some people can't relate. Some people can't relate. There's a Father who loves you and the only thing they can relate is their, their Father who was abusive. They just can't relate. What's a loving Father like? I don't understand. It's sad. But if, if you were raised with a Father who was abusive, a father who, who, who did not raise right and did not do what is right. Let me tell you, there, that is not the father that God is. He is a loving father, a merciful father. He is the father of the fatherless. Amen. And of, of the fatherless. Amen? Amen? A father who loves you. As priests of our home. Father, the godly father is also a man of prayer. He goes to God often on behalf of his family, asking for wisdom. There has been many times in our life where I have had to go through our home, anointing our doors with oil and praying over our home. God, bless our home. Fill it, God. Pray for your family. Pray for your house. Pray for your children. I, remind, I want to remind you of a story that of Job, of how Job was praying for his children. Amen? Amen. In Job 1.5, it says, it says, early in the morning, Job would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children would sin and curse God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. Amen. He would pray for his family. He would pray for his children. There are many times I walk into my kid's room and I pray and I say, God bless this room in the name of Jesus. I do a double prayer in Sarah, Lydia's, and Lizzie's room. <laughs> Lord, bless my kids. Bless my children. Parents need to know. Kids need to know that their parents are praying for them. Nothing like being on the floor praying by your bed and having a kid walk in. Suzanne was sharing a, a couple stories of that happening. You okay? I can't remember exactly what. 
But even to me in prayer, there's times where I'm praying in the living room by myself. And in my prayer, I'm thinking, someone's going to walk in and think I'm, like, dying. <laughs> you know? They won't know the difference. I'm praying sometimes. You know, one day, oh, he's just praying. Three days later, he's still praying. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> we have to be praying fathers, amen? Amen. Yeah. Another attribute of Joshua is he had a plan for his family. He had a plan for his family. Being a priest of the family is not enough. It's not just saying, I'm just going to be a godly father, I'm going to pray for my family, I'm going to do this thing. But he had a prayer, he had a plan for his family. His, his Christianity was not self-absorbed. I can't tell you how many fathers, Christian fathers, say, well, I love God, and I don't know about my kids. I'm hoping they do. He led his family. He says, I love God, and he makes a declaration. As for me and my house, he makes that. We will serve the Lord. Amen. Not, well, I'm going to. If you want to come, go ahead. I can't tell you how many times I have heard father, I've talked to fathers and said, to where's your kids? Oh, they wouldn't get up for church. They didn't want to come. What are you talking about? Would you tolerate that if they said, I'm not going to school? They would say, I'm going to allow my kids to make their own decisions. What if the decision was bad? We must strive with God's help for family unity. When Joshua spoke, his voice rang with the sound of unity. Me and my house. Not just me, but me and my what? House. My house. A father has the God-given right to instill his will on his children in his house. Amen. 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 You can't control me. It's free will. Not in my house. There's nothing free. Me and my house, we will serve God. Amen. Don't be, and, and let me give you the little attorney side note, like with OAC credit, 2.5%, blah, blah, blah. Let me give that to you. Don't be a lordship over your home. I have heard people being a lordship over your home. You know, when you become the priest of your home, the kids want to follow you. But if you're a jerk and a hypocrite, and you are just the Lord, ah, no, no, you become different than a loving father, a godly father. You become a taskmaster. Amen. The greatest people who will know whether or not you're a hypocrite is your children. Yes. They'll know. They'll know. We must strive for God's help for family unity. Me and my house. There was togetherness. His faith was genuine, authentic, and as a result, his family said, in essence, whatever you say, Dad, we will agree. There's nothing like those words. Amen. Amen? Whatever you say, Dad, we will agree. Amen. When the family is united, it will endure the trials that come its way. Amen? Amen. I have seen in my family, my kids, my wife. I've seen my kids killing each other. <laughs> Being kids. When you have a five month old and a 13 year old and everything in between by seven, there's gonna be factions in there. But one thing I have also seen that when trials and tribulations, and when things happen where there comes time of seriousness for God, I have seen the unity, the strength of back to back saying, we stand united under this. We stand united under this. I've seen the oldest teach the youngest. Now, you know, come on, you got to pray. Come sit here with me and pray with me. There has to be. When kid children, when a priest or a man, a father, teaches their children and he makes that declaration, he has a plan for that unity. Unity under God. Amen? Amen. 
Ten ways a father fails is, is they fight. If you want to have disunity in your family, among your children, among you, one thing, you if, you, if that's your goal, let me tell you what, what accomplishes that goal is fighting with your wife in front of your children. Fighting with your wife in front of your children. When you fight with your wife, or your wife fights with you and you're sitting there arguing, and you're yelling at each other, and you're blah, 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 there will be disunity in your house. Your kids will feel it, they'll know it, they'll see it, mm -hmm. and they'll ravage it like a pack of wolves. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Don't think that. <coughs> they'll use it. Many kids know how to manipulate it. Yeah. They were born with that evil sin. <laughs> when you fight family, we're a family, we love God as for me and my house, we love the Lord you witch what's wrong with you <coughs> they see that they see the argument, the fighting <laughs> you can't do that you have disagreements take, take it aside talk to each other outside of the view of your children Amen. Amen. You know what happens, fathers, when you fight with your wife? They will marry a man who's just like you, and they will think that fighting like you're doing is a normal part of marriage, and it's okay. And they will tolerate someone who does not treat them right because their father didn't treat their mother right, and their mother seems like she was okay with it, so she has to be okay with it. And you will be there pulling your head, trying to figure out why your daughter keeps bringing losers, excuse the expression, into her lives. Why your daughter is bringing men who don't love God, who don't honor God, who have no regard for their lot, for them. And then you will also wonder why your sons are treating their women like that. Because you're the example. So when you fight, you're not only affecting yourselves, but you're affecting and infecting those around you. Repent. Amen. Another way, stifle your children's questions by saying, don't bother me now, I'm busy. There are times where I've said that. But every time, don't bother me now, I'm busy. There is times where I have had, guys, you've had to sometimes pull yourself under control. There's times where I am on, focused on doing a project and my daughter's coming, Dad, look at this that I drew. And I have to and turn my chair. Oh, nice, that's great. <laughs> and looked at it and said, oh, that's good, good job. And then turn around, oh, okay. But take the time. Take the time. If you take no interest in your children's friends, you will fail as a father. Amen. Hey, we care about our children's friends, who they are. My kids will tell you. My kids will tell you. So three of them have Facebook. We tell them we want to know who your friends are on Facebook. Amen. We got a we got our youngest daughter, Sarah, just got Facebook and she came over to us. She goes, Mom, uh, I went to go uh, friend someone on Facebook who, who was going to our church, and they got a lot of bad stuff on their web page. Amen. Page. I thought they were going to our church. I thought they were Christians. Yep. And we kind of just bit our tongue and said, honey, next time ask. Next time ask. Your kids see your Facebook page too. So Amen. We are in the digital age, aren't we? If you really want to feel as a father, never discipline your children. Never discipline your children, never. You want to fail, never discipline them. You know, undisciplined children are just a horror to you and to others. You go to a movie or to a store, 
of undisciplined children with undisciplined children. Have you ever said this while walking at the mall or at Walmart or any other store and said, if that was my kid, I would have killed it a long time ago. <laughs> You understand? Don't let your kids be like that either. If you're not going to discipline your children, let me be, let me assure you something. The world will. And the world's discipline is worse yep. than the discipline you could ever instill in your kids. Amen? That's right. You've got to discipline your children, no matter how much you love them. That's love. Spanking them, that's not right. It's not right. Right. Amen? Amen. I'm guilty of this one. Nag about their schoolwork. <laughs> but never compliment them on their achievements. If anyone knows me, I'm an A, what do you call it, student, or A uh, uh, father. I want A's. A's, A's and B's, A's and B's, A's, 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 A's. A's. My kid, I got an 85%. I said, I think that's a C. No, Dad, it's a B. I'm like, no. 85% is a C. Or 84, I think it's 84. 84% is a C. 85 to 95 is a B. 95 and above is A. Well, not in this school. I said, in my school, 85%. There you go. <laughs> sometimes I have to catch myself. And I have to go, okay, what about the other ones? <laughs> I go, well, good job there. But this one you need to pick up. You know, and if they bring a C, which they brought in a C, and I said, uh, what? If you nag your children about their schoolwork and never compliment them on achievements, it's frustrating. You do great. And then that one little bad thing, you're like, ah! It's natural, isn't it? Yep. We've got to catch ourselves. Amen. Demonstrate your love. If you want to fail as a father, demonstrate your love for them with material things. Just wow. give them anything they want. Right. I have seen parents who spoil their kids. They are just spoiled by What do you want? Okay, here you go. Right. Do it. Can I have I want that. I don't know you can have that. I want it. Okay, here you go. Anything they want, they point, they want. I want, I want, I want, I want. Well, guess what? Daddy, mommy ain't gonna be there forever. And when they don't get what they want, guess what's going to happen? All hell will break loose. Yeah. In their family. In their home. In their life. I, I, am, I, am, I am still, to this day, to this day, haunted, haunted with the image. I'm not going to have to use you. Throw you under the bus over here. Hi. I am haunted with the image of my mom walking out of Kmart, dragging my sister Nora by the hair. <laughs> because she just had to have that. Because it was a makeup. And there was no way that she was going to leave that place without having it and watching my dog, my sister, getting dragged, <laughs> my mom yanking her, kicking and screaming because she wanted that makeup. I am still haunted with that image. <laughs> oh, man. I didn't say so. No way. <laughs> <laughs> I say my dad spoiled us a little. Anything we wanted, Give it to us. First people to get Atari, first people to get a computer, first people to get all this stuff. It's been good, but I assure you, it's affected us in some sense too. Sometimes getting what you want is not always the best. Sometimes you have to endure. Sometimes your children have to endure and say, if the only way you're demonstrating your love is by giving them, giving them, giving them, giving them, giving them, it's not the way to do it. Amen? Amen. Show them other ways. Give your children. Fine. Provide for them. Give them the toy. Whatever it is. But show them love in different ways. Not just in material. Never discuss the... If you want to fail, never discuss the facts of life with your kids either. And I'm not talking about the facts of life. 
No. With Nat, with Nat on the end, all those other ones. Oh, man. Take the good and take the bad. <laughs> I can't even remember what the name of the people are. Gary. Gary. Yeah, yeah, the facts of life. Never sit down and tell your kids about the birds and the bees. Or, or certain things of life. Or never talk to them about the dangers of alcohol and, and drugs and stuff like that. My kid is 13 going on. 19, she just amazes me, drives me nuts sometimes. <laughs> and she talks to me about that, that's gross. I can't even talk to code to my wife anymore. <laughs> she knows all the code words now. She knows all the code words. I can't even figure out, I'm like, how did you know this code word? It's like she like took our code book and figured it out. Just, I don't know. You know? The cuckoo nest is on top and the airplane is flying. You better catch the moon. Here it comes. Oh, oh that's gross, Dad! <laughs> <laughs> that's disgusting. What did I say? I'm just saying, let's go to the movies. I assure you all, I'm just saying. You can't even talk code to him anymore. <laughs> talk to him about the facts of life. Don't be afraid. I, always, I saw this thing that said, hey, parents, gross your children out. That's gross. You know, Anna does that. Whenever I kiss my wife, she goes, that's sick. I said, stop looking. That, I'm, that's gross. Turn your head. <laughs> this is the things that between mom and dad. Set a bad example to your children. So that they, when they say, when I grow up, I don't want to be like them. You ever hear that? I'm not going to be like my dad when I grow up. That's a bad example. Mm -hmm. You want people to grow up and say, I want to be like my dad. When my daughters grow up and they're used to see their singing, and when they're at home, they sing a lot. I got, I got, I'm like a 24-hour musical <laughs> in my house. I don't need to go to a Broadway show. They're like, hey, Dad, we, we just made something up. Come on over. We got a big old show. Even when right another day, Sarah and Lawrence spent the night. The next day, I had this big old musical music video in front of me. <laughs> Sit down, we got this music video. I'm like, okay. <laughs> they want to be like their mom. Be like mom. Be like mom. They want to be like their mom. Singer. She sings. She does this. I'll be like mom. Be like mom. They even go in there and steal mom's jewelry. <laughs> Because they want to be like mom. And that's good if daughters want to be like mom. If sons want to be, I need to talk to them. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, but sons should be like their want to be like their father. I want to be like my dad. I'm already halfway there. <laughs> example to your children. Absolutely refuse to believe that if you're not, if you are told that your children have done something wrong, don't believe it. That's horrible. Guys, we have to come to terms. Amen. Because sometimes our kids did something wrong and we got it. They're not always innocent. My dad used to sit me down. And my mom, don't be around those. Those people are bad examples. I'm used to be like, oh yeah, yeah, huh? Yeah. I was the one, not them. Right. Man, oh, their man. parents should have warned them. <laughs> you know, I was the bad one. Oh. I was the one in the wrong. But oh my, you know, if your kids, your kids are not always innocent. If your kids see that you're always taking their side, you're always compassionate upon them, always taking their side. That's going to be a fail for you not to teach your kids anything. Amen. Amen? Amen. And last, if you really want to make you fail, let your children make their own choice in matter of religion. Wow. I can't tell you how, how horrible that is. Amen. How horrible that is. To make their own decision in religion. I'm, going to, I'm not going to force religion on my kids. I'm going to let them choose. Well, guess what? Nine out of ten times, they'll choose wrong. Amen. They'll choose wrong. 
and to only choose what you guide them, show them. And to only choose that if, if something terrible has to happen in their life. But why wait? Why have to wait for that? Amen. Amen? Why? Uh, look at this. Look at Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Teach your kids to serve Christ. Don't let them make the decision. Why would you make, let them make a decision when you know that the only correct and accurate way is Jesus Christ? Amen. Do you understand that? That doesn't make sense. If you know, if you truly know that the only way to salvation is in Jesus Christ, why would you allow your children to make a wrong decision? Right. Think about the reasoning to that. I'm going to let my kids choose. I tell my kids, hey, what, you need to go to grandma's house? This is the way to get there. You take this road, 27th Avenue, south to Bethany. Make a left, head east. Get to, get to this street, make a left. You'll find grandma's house. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I don't say, choose your way. I want to get to grandma's house. Oh, okay. I'll let you choose which way you want to go. I don't want to tell you which way to go. You decide. That's ridiculous. Amen. Because we know the truth. You know what? If, if I did not know the truth, if I was not sold out on the fact that, that Jesus Christ is the way to eternal life, if I was not sold out to that, of course my kids can choose. But because I'm so sold out that I know Jesus Christ is the way to eternal life, I love my kids so much that I want them to be saved and I'm going to tell them, you got to serve Jesus Christ. He is the way to heaven. You've got to choose Christ in your life. Amen? You've got to. Because you know that you know that you know it's the truth. Well, I don't want to stuff religion down my children's throat. You stuff school down their throat. You stuff sobriety down their throat. If your kids were doing drugs, you would say to them, don't do drugs. Don't stuff that down my throat, mom. Dad. Don't stuff sobriety down my throat. Don't stuff school down my throat. It doesn't make sense, folks. If we know that the truth is Jesus Christ and he is the way to heaven, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to be just a little bit passionate on this fact, then we must, we must, as true believers, as true fathers, as true mothers, teach our kids and push them towards the way, the right way. Amen. Parents push our children to education, go to college. You, you, here's the right man. Choose the right man. Here's the right woman. Choose the right woman. We push our kids and show them the right way. We don't let our kids make decisions that we know, that we know, that we know are wrong. And if we believe and truly believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, then we must also truly believe that any other way is wrong. Amen. And to allow our kids to choose any other way is hate. Do not show your kids and push them and encourage them to Christ is also hate. You are damning your kids. Amen. So children, when your father or your mother says, get to church, you need to serve God. You need to serve Jesus Christ. You need God in your life. You need to surrender. You need to repent. You need to do the right thing. It's not because they're a nag and they hate you. They want to save you. They want you to be in heaven because they know that the only true way is through Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Stand strong, fathers, and declare, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's a lot of great mothers out there. I assure you, there are a lot of great mothers. I, I really don't know any, I, I can't tell you I've known any bad mothers. There's been some, like you read them on the news. 
Like I killed my kids because God told me to do so. <laughs> Those ones, and you know, I sold my, you know, my kid on Craigslist. There's some bad mothers. There are some. There, there are some bad mothers out there, but a majority, a majority of the mothers are good mothers. They, I, they have this motherly instinct to love their kids. They really do. I assure you, there are horrible fathers out there. Horrible fathers. There are more horrible fathers. Than, as a matter of fact, if you took the ratio, fathers versus mothers, I mean, fathers would be the ocean and mothers would be the lakes. The, it's so narrow of a bad mother, but it's so vast with the bad fathers. Horrible fathers. Fathers who, who are not godly. Fathers who don't raise their kids right, and everything else we just said this morning. That's why when you come across a man who loves God and is raising his children in the ways of Christ, this is a man that is worth honoring. Amen. That is a man who is worth honoring. Amen? Do you understand that? Yes. That's why Jesus ends everything with amen. Amen. <laughs> It's really difficult to find. You know, in Proverbs 31, it says to find a, a, a wife. The Proverbs 31 woman is about, uh, is about the wife. It's about the woman to find a virtuous wife. How precious it is. Yes. The wife who loves her husband, who takes care of her children and all that stuff. Right? It's very, very precious but to find that godly man. It's so, so difficult. It's so difficult. But when you find them, oh, man. Whoa. Those men who, who, are, who raise their kids up, who, raise, who, who treat their wives right, who, who raise their children right, who provide for their household. I mean, look how strong it is. It says this, if a man does not provide for his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Worse than an infidel. That's powerful, amen? Mm -hmm. You know, for be, being a man to, guys, when you, listen, ladies, when you find a man which is, that, is, that loves God and that really has a heart for God, hang on to that man. That's really, really difficult to find. There's a lot of men out there who are cuckoo. They have no idea what it means to serve God. They really don't, you know? They, they, they have no problem being on their white stallion and show you all the great things, but once you live in their castle, you're dead meat. But find a man who has the heart for God. These are men who are honored and worth honoring. Not that every man who confesses himself, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, uh, let's go to the bar. You know? Amen. Amen? So, when you find a man that's worth honoring, and these are the men... We want to honor in this church today, in this life. Amen in this place. Amen. Happy Father's Day, man. Happy Father's Day. You too.